Hello and welcome back to part 16 of this video series on why the pre-tribulation rapture is a false doctrine. In this video we are continuing our survey of church history looking at different views concerning the timing of the rapture. As we have demonstrated thus far throughout the overwhelming vast majority of church history, Lay leaders, pastors, bishops, scholars, and theologians have universally held and taught a post-tribulational rapture, not a pre-tribulational rapture. Rather, a rapture that coincides with the resurrection and the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, at the last day, at the day of the Lord. Other than by a few fringe, unusual individuals with some weird ideas, the pre-tribulational rapture was never held or taught or believed until the 1830s when John Nelson Darby codified and popularized this very new and heterodox doctrine. We have been discussing how some pre-tribbers today are trying to claim that the early church fathers taught pre-tribulational ideas. And so far we've discussed the church father Irenaeus. In this video we're going to look at another church father, Victorinus. Saint Victorinus of Patau, as he was called, was from Slovenia, Europe. He was a Christian ecclesiastical writer who flourished about 270 AD and who was martyred during the persecution of Emperor Diocletian. A bishop of Potovio in Slovenia, Victorinus composed commentaries on various texts within the Holy Scriptures. Victorinus was a very important figure in the history of the early church and his understanding of the book of Revelation. He wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't know that later Jerome, the Latin church father, edited, altered, and sort of republished Victorinus's commentary. Jerome actually edited Victorinus's work in a bit more of a reformed covenantal sort of replacement theology framework. He reframed it in more of an amillennial framework. But Victorinus, on the other hand, was actually premillennial. So this is interesting. So sometimes when you go online or even if you find a published work in someone's site, something from Victorinus, it could actually be Victorinus or it could actually be Jerome who had edited Victorinus's writings after the fact. So oftentimes things are credited to Victorinus when it was actually Jerome who may have written that portion of the commentary. So there's a little bit of interesting history there. But Victorinus definitely played a very important influential role in the history of understanding the book of Revelation. We will see in our study here in this video that Victorinus thoroughly, clearly, and unarguably taught a post-tribulational rapture. He expected the church to face the great persecution, the great tribulation, and to face the Antichrist, and to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. Despite this fact, there have been various pre-trib teachers in more recent years who have been teaching otherwise, actually claiming that Victorinus held to a pre-tribulational rapture. But this is simply not true. All you have to do is look at his writings. As I mentioned in my last video, part 15, pre-tribber James Morris wrote a book entitled Ancient Dispensational Truth, and he claimed that Irenaeus and Victorinus were both pre-tribbers. We saw that to be untrue regarding Irenaeus, and we will also see in this video how Victorinus was also a post-tribber. Another well-known pre-trib teacher, Mike Golay, also has tried to claim that Victorinus was preaching a pre-tribulational rapture. Mike Golay recently said to an audience regarding Victorinus the following, and I quote, I'm going to read you the passage of Revelation that Victorinus is going to comment on, and he's a little nutty in his interpretation, but he's assuming that the rapture has already happened when these vents shake down. He says, Even a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. The fig tree was shaken, loses its untimely figs, when men are separated from the church by persecution. Who goes through the persecution? Not the church. End quote. Here Mike Golay just did a brazen version of completely twisting what Victorinus just said, and he did it right in front of everyone. He reads it real quick, and then he says, Who goes through the persecution? Then he says, Not the church. 
he's actually quoting Victorinus as if that's what Victorinus is saying. Now let's just read through what Victorinus actually said to see if what he says agrees with what Mike Golay is saying. So at first he's reading from Revelation chapter 6. You'll notice Victorinus' commentary from 270 here on the Apocalypse, Revelation 6, 13 through 14. It says, And the stars fell to the earth. The falling of the stars are the faithful who are troubled for Christ's sake. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, the fig tree, when shaken, loses its untimely figs. When men are separated from the church by persecution, and the heaven withdrew as a scroll that is rolled up. For the heaven to be rolled away, that is, that the church shall be taken away. He goes on, And every mountain and the islands were moved from their places. Mountains and islands removed from their places intimate that in the last persecution all men departed from their places. That is, the good will be removed, seeking to avoid the persecution. End quote. So that's what Victorinus had to say in his commentary there. In Revelation here, the Apostle John says that the stars fell to the earth, and then he gives his interpretation. He says, The falling of the stars from heaven to the earth are the faithful who are troubled for Christ's sake. Well, what does that mean, troubled? It's actually saying that they are upset or disturbed and fall away from the faith. They apostatize, they leave the church. John goes on to say, using the example of a fig tree casting her untimely figs. What does that mean? It's not talking ripe fruit. It's saying those figs are past ripe. They are past the time of harvest. The tree drops them. It sheds them where they fall to the ground and rot. The Apostle John here in Revelation chapter 6 is saying that what happens in nature, even as the fig tree gets rid of its overly ripe fruit, the bad fruit in the church will be separated by persecution. Okay, so this is what I want to focus in on, because Victorina says that in the last days, the stars falling from the heaven, he's speaking of men in the church who will be separated. Some of the Christians who will be troubled, they will be separated from the church by what? By persecution. It doesn't say that the rapture will separate the church from the other people here. Revelation here is saying that men likened to overripe figs that are no longer good will be separated from the church by persecution. In other words, he's saying during that time many will leave the church. They will apostatize. They will abandon the church. They will walk away from the church because of persecution. Nothing about a rapture there. This is also what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 24 verse 9 where he said, speaking of the end times, at that time, many will fall away from the faith, and the love of most will grow cold. So that's exactly what Victorinus is saying here in his commentary on Revelation chapter 6, that many will leave the church because of persecution. Also, we have the parable of the sower. It says they didn't have deep roots when persecution or tribulation comes, that they leave behind the faith. They abandon the faith due to persecution. So that's what it says, okay? It's not referring to some secret rapture the Bible doesn't talk about. And Victorinus never taught the idea of a pre-tribulational rapture. But Mike Golay continues his comments to his audience here. He goes on to say, And the heaven withdrew is as a scroll that is rolled up. That is, that the church shall be taken away, and every mountain and the islands were moved from their places. Mountains and islands removed from their places intimates that in the last persecution, all men departed from their places. That is, that the good will be removed, and they, he says, seeking to avoid the persecution because they all knew in the first century, second century, that if you came to Jesus, it was known in the churches throughout the teachings of the apostles, and now these guys, that you don't go through this persecution or this tribulation or the so-called day of the Lord period, leading up to the second coming. He goes on, now I know this guy's a little kooky in his interpretation, but you got to at least admit that he believes in a pre-trib rapture, end quote. No, we don't have to admit that. In fact, we shouldn't admit that because that is not what Victorinus said. Once again, Mike Golay twisted and distorted his words in front of a whole room full of people. He says that the people will be moving all over the world doing what? 
seeking to avoid the persecution. But it doesn't say they will be raptured, seeking to avoid the persecution. It's not what it says at all. Now let's go ahead and just look at the words of Victorinus to see if our brother Mike Golay here has the right interpretation. Let's look at the writings of Victorinus to see what he actually taught. Let's look at the quotation in question first. Here Victorinus says in his commentary, Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, the fig tree when shaken loses its untimely figs, when men are separated from the church by persecution. And the heaven withdrew as a scroll that is rolled up. For the heaven to be rolled away, that is, that the church shall be taken away. And every mountain and the islands were moved from their places. Mountains and islands removed from their places intimate that in the last persecution all men departed from their places. That is, the good will be removed, seeking to avoid the persecution. Here the fig tree, when shaken, loses its figs. What does that mean? This means when men are separated from the church by persecution. That's the very clear meaning. When shaking happens, men will be separated from the church. The men are separated from the fig tree by what? The rapture? No. The church will be separated by persecution. It very clearly states that. So let's at least be honest here and admit what Victorinus was actually saying. Next, Victorinus comments on the next portion of Revelation, and he says, Heavens rolled up, what does that mean? He says, for the heaven to be rolled away, that's the church to be taken away. And then he moves on to the next quote from Revelation, And every mountain and the islands were moved from their places. Then he says, here's what that means. So when he says that the heavens are rolled up, he says that's referring to the church. And he says the mountains are moved from their place. What does that mean? Then he explains it. He says mountains and islands removed from their places intimate that it is the last persecution. Okay, so he wasn't talking about some rapture here. Victorinus is obviously speaking about the last persecution during the Great Tribulation. All men departed from their places. In other words, people will move all over the place. The world is going to be very chaotic. There's going to be persecution. Men will be moving around because of it, seeking to avoid the persecution. All he's saying here is the righteous will be fleeing from place to place. You see statements like this, by the way, throughout early church writers, but you'll also see it in the scriptures and the gospels, for example, where Jesus says, when you see these things, flee to the mountains. You have various references in the Bible such as, Come out of her, my people. Flee, hide yourselves. Close the doors for a little while during the tribulation. It's not talking about the rapture. It's talking about fleeing to avoid persecution. So when Victorina speaks of someone being separated from the church, they leave the church because of persecution. He's not talking about some secret rapture that the Bible never mentions. Okay, so let's look at another statement again. These are all part of Victorinus's commentary on the book of Revelation. He says here, The little season signifies three years and six months, in which, with all his power, the devil will avenge himself under Antichrist against the church. He says the little season. Okay, this little period of time signifies three years and six months. He's obviously referring to the three and a half years of the final period of the Great Tribulation. And he says, with all of his power, the devil will avenge himself under the Antichrist against the church. So does Victorinus here teach that the church will be removed before the Tribulation? No, he says, the Antichrist will avenge himself against the church. That's crystal clear and unarguable. There's no nebulous, blurry vagueness to this statement. It's crystal clear to Victorinus that the Antichrist will persecute the church. Here's another statement by Victorinus. It says, And I saw, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. In the sixth seal, then, was a great earthquake. This is that very last persecution. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The sun becomes a sackcloth, that is, the brightness of doctrine will be obscured by unbelievers. And the entire moon became as blood, 
by the moon of blood is set forth the church of the saints as pouring out her blood for Christ. And the stars fell to the earth. The falling of the stars are the faithful who are troubled for Christ's sake. Here's an example of Victorinus using very allegorical interpretation. Instead of saying, I think it means that the sun will become black, he says the brightness of correct doctrine will be obscured by unbelievers. Okay, so that's unusual. And again, he quotes Revelation. He says, and the entire moon became as blood. And then here's his interpretation. He says, by the moon of blood is set forth the church of the saints as pouring out her blood for Christ. Okay, here we are in the sixth seal. And Victorina sees the statement, the moon will turn to blood. He says what that means is that the church will pour out her blood for the name of Jesus. Here again, the stars fell to the earth. The falling of the stars are the faithful who are troubled for Christ's sake. In other words, they are faithful, but they receive persecution. They receive trouble because of the name of Jesus, and as a result, they fall. This is the beginning of the statement that Mike Golay reads. Now, if you simply read one line, one sentence before the quote that he cites, what is Victorina saying? He says, the church of the saints will shed their blood. So if you're a responsible teacher and you're quoting Victorinus and saying, look, you have to admit he teaches a pre-trib rapture, wouldn't it be more responsible to read the entire text in context? One line before it clearly says the church will shed her blood under the Antichrist at the sixth seal. Here's another one of Victorinus' commentaries on Revelation chapter 16. He says, the woman flew into the desert with the assistance of the wings of a great eagle, that is, of two prophets. This is the whole Catholic Church. So, Victorinus says, a woman flew into the desert with the assistance of the wings of a great eagle, that is, of the two prophets. And then he says that this is the whole Catholic Church. So, I obviously disagree with Victorinus here, where he says the woman in Revelation 16, and he interprets the woman as the Catholic Church. But anyway, the woman hides. What does she do? She flees, seeking to avoid persecution. She moves from one place to the other. So here in Revelation chapter 16, the woman, with the assistance of the wings of two eagles, flees into the desert, and Victorinus here sees the whole Catholic Church hiding from the Antichrist. So even though he's got that interpretation wrong, he's still seeing that they're hiding from the Antichrist there. Finally, Victorinus in his commentary says, And I saw an angel descending from the rising of the sun. This is his commentary on Revelation 7. He says, I saw an angel descending from the rising of the sun. He is speaking of Elijah the prophet, who was to come before the time of the Antichrist to restore and to strengthen the churches from the intolerable persecution. So here again he quotes Revelation, then he gives his commentary, he's speaking of Elijah the prophet. Victorinus here believes that John is talking about the two witnesses who were to come before the time of the Antichrist to restore and strengthen the churches from the intolerable persecution. So he says, Elijah will come, now granted he says he will come before the time of the Antichrist. Does that mean he arrives and then ministers during the time of the Antichrist or before? Again, regardless as to what he believes, he says, Elijah, one of the two witnesses, will come for the purpose of what? Strengthening the church from intolerable persecution. Strengthening the church from the Great Tribulation. So again, Victorinus absolutely, completely was a post-tribber, not a pre-tribber. There's really no getting around it shouldn't even be up for debate. Again, these pre-trib teachers who try to prove a pre-trib rapture are just extremely sloppy in their research, trying to prove that the church fathers or the apostles believed in a pre-tribulational rapture. We must be true Bereans regarding our research and not make claims that aren't true. We need to be responsible, obedient Christians to the commandments of Scripture to test these things to see whether or not they're true. There is not a single early church writer that taught a pre-tribulational rapture. Not a single statement anywhere in any of the early centuries of the church. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that Victorinus wasn't teaching pre-tribulational rapture. Now let's look at another of the church fathers of the name of Cyprian. 
Cyprian, who lived from 210 to 258 AD, was a bishop of Carthage and an early Christian writer of Berber descent, many of whose Latin works are still in existence. He is recognized as a saint in the Western and Eastern churches. He lived in North Africa, perhaps at Carthage, where he received a classical education. Soon after converting to Christianity, he became a bishop in 249 AD. Now here's a quote from pre-trib teacher and author Ken Johnson in his book Rapture. In his book, here's what he has to say, and I quote, He says Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage about 250 AD. Notice he did not teach we must endure the time of the Antichrist, but we will be delivered from it. He told his readers that the coming resurrection was the hope of the Christian and pointed out that the rapture, snatching us, should motivate us as we see the last days approaching, end quote. So now let's test Ken Johnson's claim here to see whether or not it's true. Here's a statement from Cyprian in his work Treatise on the Antichrist in 250 AD. He says, We who see that terrible things have begun and know that still more terrible things are imminent, may regard it as the greatest advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. Do you not give God thanks? Do you not congratulate yourself that by an early departure you are taken away and delivered from the shipwrecks and disasters that are imminent? Let us greet the day which assigns each of us to his own home, which snatches us hence and sets us free from the snares of the world and restores us to the paradise and the kingdom. So Cyprian says, we who see that terrible things have begun, he goes on to say, we're looking out at the world, we see terrible things have begun, and know that still more terrible things are imminent, much more worse things are coming. We may regard it as the greatest advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. I fully understand how a pre-tribber at a quick glance could read this and say, aha, Cyprian is talking about a pre-trib rapture. However, the only thing Cyprian is talking about here is dying before the tribulation. That's all he's talking about. He's talking about dying, leaving the world, and going to paradise or going to heaven. Again, read it in context. Let us greet the day which assigns each of us to his own home. Let us greet the day in which our death will be presented to us and we can escape this world. That's all he's saying here. This is easy to prove what he's saying here because in another statement, Cyprian says, he says, Nor let any one of you, beloved brethren, be so terrified by the fear of future persecution or the coming of the threatening Antichrist as not to be found armed for all things by the evangelical exhortations and precepts and by the heavenly warnings. Antichrist is coming, but immediately the Lord follows to avenge our sufferings and our wounds. So he says, don't let any of the brethren be so afraid of the coming great tribulation and persecution that you're not armed. Don't let fear disarm you. He says, yes, the Antichrist is coming, but immediately after that, the Lord will come back. And what will the Lord do? He will avenge our sufferings and our wounds. So Cyprian was speaking to his audience and he says to them, don't anyone be afraid of the coming great tribulation and the Antichrist. Does he say that because you'll be raptured out of here before then? No, he doesn't even hint at anything like that. Rather, he just says, yes, Antichrist is coming. But immediately after the Antichrist, Jesus is coming back to avenge our sufferings. Clearly, Cyprian did not teach a pre-tribulational rapture. Nothing could be further from the truth. And the one quote that Ken Johnson interprets as a pre-tribulational rapture, Cyprian is just talking about dying before the tribulation. It might be better to die before the misery of the great tribulation, but as Christians, we are looking forward to putting this wicked world behind us and finishing the race faithfully. And this is important, finishing the race that he has laid out for us and then receiving our reward. So we don't fear death, but we have faith in the resurrection, which is what the rapture actually is. Anyway, it's clear that Cyprian was not teaching a pre-tribulational rapture. I just want to read a quote from another church father named Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril lived from 313 to 386 AD. He was a theologian of the early church. 
about the end of 350 AD, he became a bishop in Jerusalem. He says in one of his writings, He, Antichrist, will display a murderous, most absolute, pitiless, and unstable temper toward all people, but especially towards us Christians. He will act insolently for only three and a half years. Then he will be defeated by the glorious second coming from heaven of the only begotten Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the true Christ. He will destroy Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth and commit him to the flames of hell. The point here is that Cyril of Jerusalem says that the Antichrist will be harsh toward all men, but especially towards Christians. So Cyril expected himself and his audience, his readers, to face the Antichrist. Okay, so far we've looked at John Morris's book where he tries to claim that dispensationalism is not new, that the church fathers Irenaeus and Victorinus taught pre-tribulational rapture. Well, we have seen that that is not true. And other pre-trib teachers try to teach this as well because they're embarrassed that dispensationalism is so new in history. So these men will stop at nothing to try to prove that Darby didn't invent this doctrine. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to the far more respectable, far more well-known book entitled Dispensationalism Before Darby, which is written by William C. Watson. Watson's effort is to show that there are some elements of dispensationalism that were taught before the 1800s, before the 19th century. And again, we just have to reiterate the fact that dispensationalism is a system. It's a system, and showing that elements of it were taught proves nothing other than aspects of dispensationalism are valid, but it doesn't validate the entire system. This is so important. It's, it's almost like a card trick. It's almost like a sleight of hand to say, we will prove that dispensationalism is ancient, and then just say, look, there's aspects of it here and there in history. Again, it's like a card trick. Watson, in his book, desperately tries but absolutely fails to find any evidence of a pre-tribulational rapture. But people who pick up this book might think that it shows you that there were all kinds of pre-tribulationism that was taught before Darby. The back cover of the book and the very first endorsement says, William Watson plows new ground in researching the history of eschatological thought prior to the 19th century. And then it goes on to say, to put it simply, Darby did not invent the pre-tribulational rapture idea and so forth. Here's another review of this book, and it's actually the first review on Amazon, the very first one. The individual says, A common argument against dispensationalism and the pre-tribulational rapture is that it was invented by John Nelson Darby around 1830. And then he goes on to say, Watson proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that this popular belief is absolutely false, and those who promote it grossly mischaracterize church history. That's absolutely true. Darby was the one who articulated it. Now again, he was drawing from the different weird ideas. There were all kinds of crazy ideas before him. People that believed in a partial rapture or a mid-tribulational rapture or sometimes a pre-wrath rapture. There were all kinds of ideas out there, but he is the first one that articulates the pre-tribulational rapture. The idea that we would be raptured seven years before the return of Jesus, before the tribulation. Okay, so you don't find that anywhere in church history before Darby. You just don't. But what these book reviewers say is that Watson proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that this popular belief, the idea that Darbyism is new, is absolutely false. And those who promote it grossly mischaracterize church history. So, pre-tribbers pick up this book and they believe that this is solid proof and support that the pre-trib rapture was taught before Darby. This is the problem with confirmation bias. They want to believe it, and even when they're presented with horrible evidence, they latch onto it and they say, see this guy, it's beyond any shadow of a doubt. So again, it's very misleading. Let's go ahead now and let's review this so-called proof that Watson has provided for us in his book. Now, he has two chapters in which he's trying to find evidence of a pre-tribulational rapture in chapter 7 and chapter 10 of his book. Watson fails to show a single example of a pre-tribulational rapture was ever believed during this period. 
He cites in his book over 20 different writers, and bizarrely, he even acknowledges that most of them were not pre-trib. He only claims that six of these men were pre-tribulationists. The first chapter is called Concepts of a Pre-Tribulational Rapture in 17th Century England. And then chapter 10 is called The Pre-Tribulational Rapture and Tribulation in 18th Century England. So he's got two chapters covering 200 years. Watson goes through over 20 individuals, and there's only six that he actually says teach a pre-tribulational rapture. So here he actually lists six men who are the cream of the crop. In other words, these are the best of the best that Watson has to offer to try to make his point. So let's look at each of these six men. These are the best that he has to offer in this 200-year period. He says these guys clearly taught pre-trib rapture. So let's look at his evidence. First, we will take a look at Ephraim Hewitt of 1643. Again, this is the first individual that Watson says clearly taught a pre-trib rapture. Here's a statement from Ephraim. He says, and I quote, Deliverance from outward trials is expressed by the Lord coming in the clouds. Our Lord in Matthew 24, 30, and his beloved disciple John in Revelation 1, verse 10, do couple this coming of the Son of Man in the clouds with the wailing of the Jews. So Hewitt placed our deliverance from outward trials as occurring when Jesus returns in the clouds in Matthew 24, 10, after the tribulation. Okay, so he says the church will be delivered from trials from tribulation when Jesus returns in the clouds. Then he refers to our Lord in Matthew 24, 30 and his beloved disciple John in Revelation 1, 10. Here's the problem. Matthew 24, 30 is when? After the tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 9 says, Immediately after the tribulation, and then verse 30 says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in the clouds, right? But Watson says that it was clearly pre-trib. Ephraim Hewitt here was post-trib, and he unarguably places the rapture at the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds at Matthew 24:30, something that every pre-tribber out there right now would thoroughly deny. So I guess we can cross Ephraim off our list here. He was definitely a post-tribber. The next person Watson cites in his book is Captain John Brown of 1654. Bizarrely, on page 152, Watson says Brown believed in a mid-tribulational rapture. But then he says he was clearly pre-trib on page 172. So which is it? Was Brown mid-tribulational or was he clearly pre-trib? Brown places the rapture after the abomination that causes desolation. He was either mid-trib or pre-wrath. These kinds of contradictions and inconsistencies permeate Watson's book. And we move on to the third person in his book is John Birchensha of the 1660s. Again, he's the third individual that Watson said was clearly pre-trib. Watson says, now watch this again, you can't make this stuff up. And at the end of the chapter, Watson says he was clearly pre-trib, but earlier in the chapter, here's what Watson says. John Perchensha believed that the 1260 days of Daniel ended in 1641, marking the beginning of the Great Battle of Armageddon, which he understood to be the English Civil War, when the saints began to fight back against the forces of the Antichrist. So, Berchenja here believed in many comings of Christ. So, obviously, this John Perchenja was clearly a very confused person. So, why in the world would Watson claim such an individual to support his view? So, basically, John Perchenja believed in many comings of Christ. This is what I mean by the age of confusion that I mentioned earlier. You can't just pull out some weird fringe guy who believed that the English Civil War was Armageddon who believed in many comings of Christ, and say, yeah, see, this guy is just like any dispensationalist today. No, this is just some kook who had weird ideas. He was very confused. You can't point to him and say, see, we've had these guys on our team all the way back to the 1600s. You have to just scratch your head and wonder, why is he even quoting this guy? Why would you even claim him? He was obviously confused. He clearly did not teach a pre-tribulational rapture, as Watson says. He believed in many comings of Christ. 
but we can scratch this guy off the list as well. Number four in his list in his book is Samuel Hutchinson of 1667. And his order of events was first the tribulation, then the rapture, then Armageddon. William Watson quotes him on page 159. Hutchinson goes on to say, When we see the people of God in such distress, tribulation, as was never known in the world, then we may look for Christ's appearance for the deliverance of them. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, The saints shall be gathered together unto him, according to that in Matthew 24.31. And Matthew 24.31 specifically takes place after the tribulation. So Hutchinson here was 100% post-tribulational. Here's Watson's statement. He says his order of events was first the tribulation, then the rapture, then Armageddon. Tribulation, rapture, Armageddon. He was not pre-trib. He did not put the rapture before the tribulation. You can't say that he was pre-tribulational. This is just another example where Watson in his book contradicts himself. You can't say he was clearly pre-trib and then on another page admit that he believed the rapture happened after the tribulation. So you could say Hutchinson, he could be pre-wrath, he could be mid-trib, but sometime in the midst of the tribulation, he says, we should look for the appearance of Christ. Hutchinson also says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, the saints will be gathered together unto him, according to that in Matthew 24:31. So, Samuel Hutchinson, when does he place the rapture? He says it's Matthew 24, 31, which we've already reviewed, happens when? After the tribulation. So, please read Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31. Every pre-tribber across the boards would say that has nothing to do with the rapture, even though it clearly does. Even though the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 is clearly expounding upon the words of Jesus there, in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Okay, so it's very clear Hutchinson was 100% post-trib. Then we get to the fifth example in his book, a man named Joshua Sprigg of 1676. Here's Watson's quote. He says, Joshua Sprigg hinted at a secret coming of Christ before his glorious appearance. So the best that Watson can come up with here is to say that he's hinted at it. In fact, when you read what Joshua Sprigg had to say, you have to say no. You're just misunderstanding him like you misunderstand everyone else on this list. That's the best he can come up with is a hint. And again, I would look at his example of a hint. I would say there's no hint here at all. He was not a pre-tribber. So Watson says that a hint is all Joshua Sprigg has to offer, yet he still lists him as being clearly pre-trib. Finally, the sixth man on the list, Sayer Rudd of 1734. This is really the only good example he can come up with in the 18th century. Again, this is the last of the individuals, the last of the individuals in his entire book that Watson says was clearly pre-trib. Sayer Rudd was a Baptist pastor and physician. He taught that Christ will descend several times. Again, why would Watson claim someone with such convoluted ideas of the end times as supporting his view? Again, after careful analysis of what he had to write, he was not pre-trib. He was just confused. Why would you claim someone as being on your team as supporting your doctrine who was so confused to believe that Jesus was going to return many times? just doesn't make any sense. So we just went through all six of Watson's best examples. He says all of them were clearly pre-trib, yet not a single one of them is pre-trib, as we saw. This is the best that Watson can offer in his book. In conclusion, I want to read a statement from pre-trib teacher Dr. Tommy Ice and Timothy Denny. This is from an article that is on Dr. Ice's website. He says that rapture critics must acknowledge and interact with the historical and theological evidence. And that's exactly what I'm doing here in this video. I'm interacting with the evidence and I've debunked it. I've gone through each one of these men who supposedly taught a pre-tribulational rapture and I've shown that none of them actually believed in it. How could they? It wasn't even invented yet until the 1800s when Darby came along. This is embarrassing. This is not scholarship. Watson was not a careful scholar in the writing of this book. 
He should not be held up as a scholar. In fact, this book is such a mess that if dispensationalists want to gain any measure of credibility, they actually should repudiate him. They should actually admit that Watson is not reliable. In terms of his scholarship, it's really poor. And most of these pre-trib teachers claims that the early church fathers taught the pre-tribulational rapture is just a lot of talk and wishful thinking. Okay, I'm going to end this video here, but stay tuned for my next video, part 17, where I will be discussing several other church fathers who did not preach a pre-tribulational rapture, such men as Eusebius of Caesarea and Andrew of Caesarea and others. Pre-trib teachers make claims that these church fathers also taught a pre-tribulational rapture. So we will debunk those claims in my next video. So stay tuned for that. And as always, thanks very much for watching.